Mr. Jones owned a cotton plantation and many slaves. One day he was talking to the owner of the plantation next to his, and Mr. Jones was lamenting the fact that times were tough, he was having to work his slaves harder than ever, and was having trouble with some of them being disobedient or trying to run away. The other plantation owner said he knew someone who could help. Day one. One day Mr. Jones called his slaves together so a man named Mr. Smith could talk to them. Before beginning, Mr. Smith whispered to Mr. Jones, Whatever I say, do not contradict me or interfere, and I promise you, your slave troubles will end. My name is Mr. Smith, he said to the slaves, and this may be the happiest day of your lives. From today forward, you will no longer be slaves, but free men. Mr. Jones was so shocked, he started to step forward, but Mr. Smith gestured for him to remain silent. He did, only because the other plantation owner had spoken so highly of Mr. Smith's skills. You are no longer the property of Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith continued. You are free. No more would you be forced to labor for the benefit of Mr. Jones. Now you can work for yourselves. Now the slaves were all murmuring and looking at each other. Many were smiling, many were looking puzzled. In fact, you are now free to leave the plantation whenever you want, Mr. Smith said. However, since we are surrounded by other plantations, if you leave, some other plantation owner will likely claim you as his own the moment you set foot on his property. So I urge you not to risk your newfound freedom by doing something so foolish. Instead, I suggest that you stay here, no longer as slaves, but as willing participants and part owners of this plantation. Yes, this is now your plantation. Mr. Jones bit his tongue to keep from objecting. For now, we might as well leave Mr. Jones in charge, said Mr. Smith, since he is the only one with any experience at running a plantation, which is quite a complicated thing to manage. But he will no longer be your master, but just another worker on the plantation. In fact, he will now be using his organizational and management skills to serve you. Whatever problems you may have had with him before, you are now all equals, and you need each other to make this work. If we all cooperate and work together, we can all reap the benefits together. In honor of this happy occasion, I present you this new symbol of togetherness and cooperation, this flag, which shall be the emblem of the new free Jones Plantation. He held up the new flag, but most of those listening were still too amazed to respond. And this shall be our motto, Mr. Smith announced. We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. To celebrate, everyone has the rest of the day off. Enjoy your freedom, do as you please, and be back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, so that we may begin work on this great and noble new endeavor as equal free men. Finally convinced that Mr. Smith was serious, the former slaves applauded and cheered. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. It is the 26th of October, 2020, as I'm recording this conversation, and you have just watched the beginning of The Jones Plantation, which I hope that most of my audience is familiar with, but if not, please stop this conversation and watch The Jones Plantation in its entirety. It is only 12 minutes and 30 seconds or so long. It will not take you that long to get caught up with the main subject of today's conversation, and trust me, you will be thankful that you've seen this video because I think it is uh, it is a video worth watching, even regardless of anything else going on. But it is actually the subject of today's conversation. Today we are talking to previous CorporateReport.com guests, Larkin and Amanda Rose. You will remember them from a few interviews that we've done now over the years. Of course, that can be found in my archives, and I'll link up uh, li- link that up in case you are too lazy to type the name Rose into my search bar. <laughs> but uh, Larkin, Amanda, thank you for coming on today. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much, James. Good to be back. Yes. Well, it does seem like just yesterday that we were sitting there talking uh, in real life there in Mexico. And, you know, this year has just been such a slow year, not much happening, nothing to really talk about. So it's just, uh, you know, oh, wait, sorry. Life as we know it has changed forever. The tyrannical boot in the face tyranny has uh, unveiled itself this year and we are getting prepared for the great reset of humanity so i guess before we even get into the real subject of today's conversation perhaps i'd just like to start by finding out how are you guys doing oddly we're doing remarkably well for this fake ass plague <laughs> like book sales are up and I, we actually i think a lot more people are open to the ideas of self ownership um, obviously, you have a whole lot of the herd still following along and being stupid, but I think a lot of normal people 
have basically been forced into a position where they have to start questioning stuff because it's it's gotten so ridiculous. The tyrants have gotten so ridiculous that even normal people are starting to go, wait a minute, this this seems a little over the top. <laughs> and I, I do think that a lot of people are, especially the, the sort of newbies to the liberty movement who maybe woke up to a lot of the way the world works in just the last few years. I think, I think a lot of people have this sentiment that, you know, Oh no, it's getting, it's getting worse or the, or the state actually is, is more powerful than I realized. And for those who haven't been following along history and seeing the progression of things, um, you know, I, I think that I, that's understandable, but Larkin and I have this grander, bigger picture perspective. So another way we're doing better than a lot of people is just mentally and emotionally because, you know, this is something that we see as a great sign. This is exciting because this, these are not the symptoms of authoritarian power that is has the best control it's ever had. These are the symptoms of the beginning of the end of an empire. And it can still take decades for an empire to fall, but we're in the most exciting times I think we've ever been in. So I'm opposite of what a lot of people are in that I'm not thinking, oh no, they're going to somehow gain super massive control over everybody. I'm like, this is the tide starting to turn. This is the everything coming to a head. It's going to basically get weirder before it gets better, but it's mostly going to get weirder for a while. And I'm, I'm more optimistic about the future than I've ever been. Cause like he said, fertile soil, you know, millions of people just kicked in the kneecaps by government who were, you know, plodding along and trying to just avoid that thing of over there called government and didn't realize how powerful it was. And, and now they're pissed off and they're angry and they're aware that this thing is too powerful. So we're just, we're, we're doing great in a lot of ways because it's like, it's activated Liberty people. Our book sales are up and <laughs> we're excited about the fertile mental ground in the, in the universe right now. And now we have this project. Yes. 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 Let's get into that. But I, I hear what you're saying about that. In some ways I am equally optimistic. Uh, the weirder it gets, I think the more optimistic I am because the more that we can make this into uh, denormalize what is going on, people will start to realize that there is much more playing out than they have been told their whole lives. And, oh no, conspiracy theorist will start to lose its uh, sense of a pejorative and start to be more of a factual description. So people will start to realize there is a power structure that exists in this world and it is not controlling them for their own best interests. And, uh, so, yeah, I, I do get that sense. This is a time of great awakening, and I've been talking about this for years. It w In order to create a new world order, you have to liquefy the old relations, the old verities. You have to wash them away. And that is the moment of transition where it can go either way. And it is what we make of it. We have to insert ourselves into that. And that's why it is so important at this time in history specifically to be awakening people to the real paradigm of authoritarianism versus freedom and what that means and why that is important. And there are very few tools out there for unlocking people's minds that are more effective than the work that you have been doing over the years, uh, Larkin, specifically with your writing, The Most Dangerous Superstition, the Jones Plantation, etc. These are powerful tools for getting people to denormalize what they have been trained to see all their lives and see them in a different way. So we are going to be talking about the Jones Plantation today, which again, I hope everyone has seen, or at the very least, we'll stop this conversation and watch before we start talking about it. But long story short, this is an animation that was... Animation? Still images? At any rate, it was a uh, posted to your YouTube channel, I believe, eight years ago. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. And yep. uh, tell us about the origins of this, how it came about. It's not you narrating this even. So how did that original video come about? Um, I, I really liked making that video because I did hardly anything on it. I, I wrote it and then somebody else illustrated it and somebody else narrated it. Um, it was basically just, you know, a lot of my videos are just sort of a thought that came to my mind of, you know, what if we sort of show it in this way? Because you know, just like you, it's always, you know, our challenge is say the same thing in a million different ways to try to get through to more people when it's the actual message is pretty dang simple. Um, and so just the thought of using a, a you know, a, a fake story in a setting where everybody can sort of feel comfortable about, well, that was slave days and they were bad and mean then and now we're wise and enlightened. And so that everyone can sort of be, you know, neutral and comfortable as they learn about, wow, this creepy guy doing these creepy tricks. 
And that's actually what we want to pass on to the movie is the power of being able to show somebody. And the, the, you mentioned that the conspiracy theory thing, and I think that's one of the things that's just going to get broadsided by this movie, because when people watch it, they will say, Ugh, that was creepily realistic, totally believable, and it probably would have worked on me. And that's, I, I really want the audience to identify with the people who get faked out and realize, uh, I, I wasn't the valiant noble hero in this little, you know, whether it's the animated one or the, the movie one, I was in the crowd that fell for it and hated the person who actually stood up for me. And we're totally going for the guilt trip. Um, and I think making this into a full length movie, movie, and it was actually the, the director's idea, not, not mine, but I love the idea, is, is a way to get through to people in a way that I don't think making any, anything else I've ever done into a movie would have near the potential to get through to normal people status and stuff because it's so it's so under the radar because it's a story they can think well different time different place you know that's when bad things were, and they can just sort of watch it and as they're absorbing wow you really can do these sneaky manipulations and deceptions and divide and conquer and all that and then by the end you can't miss the fact you know then they walk out of the movie theater and see a political ad and go oh 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 <laughs> yeah, and, and I think too the power of the Jones Plantation. This is something that we're we're very consistent about saying in all the interviews about it. But sort of like how our Candles in the Dark seminar is 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 this um, it's an approach that is Socratic and it's questions and it's non argumentative and it's non preachy and it doesn't involve your worldview. And the thing about Candles in the Dark when we take that approach in in, in reaching status is that we're kind of kind of sneaking in not sort of, but like we're sneaking in something that's going to make them hit cognitive dissonance by just asking questions in, in a way that's gentle to them and they don't see it coming. And it's like, we're, we're leading them up to their cognitive dissonance, but not in a way that, you know, we we're disarming them. It's very disarming the way we approach people. Well, we wanted a movie version of that and the iron web, which is his novel and the iron web has been suggested to be a movie, but that's like this punch in the face with anarchism and, and self-ownership and Andrew came to Larkin in February and uh, this director and he he actually interviewed Larkin and Anarchopolko and he wasn't even an anarchist yet then he wasn't all the way there and through talking to Larkin he quickly kind of got there and he said he's the one that said we should do the Jones Plantation as a movie and I, I thought this is a Trojan horse this is candles in the dark in a movie because it's in that removed time and place and it's it's a thing that's going to appeal to so much of the mainstream public we could make this get out there to people that have never thought about this stuff and they'll go oh cool a a movie about the south and slaves and whatever i this is so relevant right now and the blm crowd will go this is so relevant i want to see this right now and the white guilt crowd will go i want to watch this too and, the, and so like people that are interested in this sort of type of movie and weird niche independent movies are going to jump on it and then part way into it they're going to realize what they got into but they're not going to be you know, tempted to run out of the theater, they're going to be glued to their seat. And then it's going to do the days and months and years after the fact. And then people later on were like, oh, I got what the Matrix and Beaver Vendetta really was. The Jones Plantation is going to be sliding in under the radar like the Trojan horse. And then their psychology is going to hit cognitive dissonance in several ways throughout the movie and then later on. And, and it's all about them figuring things out. You know, it's like somebody watching a murder mystery and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, this is going on. And the fun of it is figuring out in your own head instead of somebody just telling you, like, I'm going to describe for you this crime and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start by telling you who did it. Like, ah, well, no, now it's kind of boring. Um, but, uh, you know, and the little animated version is so simple compared to what we can get into, like the depths of the psychology and the manipulation and stuff we can get into in a live action, you know, full length feature film. Um, I think it's literally going to be emotionally devastating <laughs> for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, the uh, the the short version, the uh, the animated version, can be. I mean, it is allegory, and it screams, "This is allegory!" and read this, you know. And so people will approach it from that <laughs> method, and it works, I think, very well in that context. But it, obviously, in the dramatic context, you can explore much more of the the nuance and everything. So I I completely understand that. But you guys jumped the gun. I haven't even formally announced it yet. Yes, you are bringing this. 
to to the f- feature film format. You're going to make a live action feature film out of this idea. You're already working on the script, I understand, and there are some teasers of that on your YouTube channel for people who are interested. And of course, they can find out more information by it directly supporting your work. But let's talk a little bit about this idea. As you say, you were appro- pro- approached by the director about doing this as a feature film. Walk us through that, uh, what happened, and what, wh- how you guys are going to bring this to, to the feature film format. Yeah, he, as she said, he interviewed me down in, um, down in Acapulco where, you know, we met last and he, I guess he was, you know, going through my stuff and learning more about me because we, we had a fun interview where he started basically his first question was, well, we can both agree that, you know, we're better off in democracy than we were under Kings. And I was like, no, he was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) So he was already sort of knocked off balance. And now he goes, yeah, you were right. We're not, we're really not. And that actually ties into the whole thing of, you know, democracy is one of the best tricks the tyrants ever came up with for faking people out. And so he came up with the idea and said, what do you think of making Jones Plantation a movie? And I thought about it for two seconds and went, of course, why didn't that? It's the perfect thing to make into a movie. And there's so many ways to go into it. And yeah, I've been, despite the fact we're, we're, our fundraiser has been running. We have a few days left in the, the 30 day um, initial window. We're all, we're about at thirty thousand raised so far, which we're thrilled about. Um, we're hoping for one hundred twenty five for the whole thing, but there's pre production and production and post production, so we still have time for for that. Um, I, I couldn't stop myself from writing the the script without any funding, <laughs> so I've been working on it many days. It's most of the way done. It's well over half done, um, and it's been so fun and so creepy writing it because being able to basically the audience gets to see here is what the slaves see here's the nice presentation that's put on for the slaves and they go wow that sounds nice and then you get the discussions that happen behind closed doors between mr smith and mr jones and you go oh that's why they did that oh that's what they're planning oh that's how they made this thing up and so you just you get to see the two positions and by changing perspectives, I think a lot of people are going to realize that, that yeah, they would have totally fallen for it. Had they been there on that plantation, they would have been going rah, rah, rah for Mr. Smith. Um, and it just, there are, there are so many little things we sneak into the movie that don't, don't show up in, in the animated version, you know, parallels to just, you know, 20 different things in current events and historically and uh, philosophy and stuff but that fit perfectly in the story. It's not, you know, it's, it's not like we're just going to run off on some random tangent. It, and I, I, I love the character of Mr. Smith, the movie version. He's a genius. He's an evil sociopath, but he's a genius and his plans and his schemes and figuring it out. And he's in the movie, he's always a couple heads, a couple steps ahead of Mr. Jones. Cause Mr. Jones is just old style tyrant whip you until you work for me. And Mr. Smith goes along and says, we're going to tell them they're free. And Mr. Jones is like, what? No, no. And so Mr. Jones is learning along the way too. Oh, that's how you do it more effectively. Um, so he's basically sort of the, the small time politician learning from the big machine. No, here's the game you actually play if you really want power. So we can really represent like the kind of the big shift in history in two people. You have Mr. Jones. It's like, that's the old way that's, you know, feudalism and violence and going after the people you want money from with swords and the peasants have crap for floors and, you know, the <laughs> that stuff didn't work. And then Smith is the cunning, toxic, narcissist, psychopath who knows human psychology and he's like represents, you know, this new world way of thinking that is, no, totally treat the slaves like they're, you know, free in the sense that they think they are and if you set it up right they'll they won't run away they won't run off and do anything they'll totally be basically your indentured slaves forever if you just understand how to shift their perspective so you get to see that old way in history where we are now and it's gonna be this thing that unfolds gradually throughout the movie where by the end it is unmistakable the parallels to modern day so that people are just sitting there going Oh crap! Because they because <laughs> they realize how how obvious it is that this is what the modern system is doing, and it's going to even have these 
there's subtle ways where even with the the dialogue having to match, you know, how people talked back then, how they would have used language, we're still going to slip in things that that are so parallel to things going on now, um, things that politicians have said, sometimes even exact lines that work to put even, you know, in the script where Mr. Smith says it and, and just tie in stuff that's going to make people go, oh, crap. <laughs> and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, I, you know, Andrew came to us with this in February and what's been happening behind the scenes is before this Indiegogo campaign, we were meeting up with him for months, basically since Anarchapulco doing storyboarding, talking about how funding a movie works. He's a director. He's like, I've got all these connections. I can do, I can, we can do this well for non big budget. We don't have to have millions of dollars. We don't have to pay big budget actors. He's like, I know good actors who aren't big budget actors, but they're good. I can get access to a great camera crew and, and the best, you know, the Hollywood performance professional look, the camera, and that whole crew, I can do this. And he figured out what we can do uh, cost-wise, and then it led up to the Indiegogo campaign, and we realized, okay, we can get it shot, we can shoot the movie for about 30, then there's post-production and all that other stuff, and we could really do it well and nail it and even make money on it and have it look professional and have the best acting for still 125 grand. So we decided that was the happy number to shoot for. And then we realized this community is big enough and we could fund it with this community because Indiegogo allows that to happen. So yeah. And nobody, uh, us and Andrew are the final say in it. No Hollywood studio is going to have their tentacles. They're not within a hundred miles of the script. This is going to be exactly what we want it to be. So even if Sony came to us and was like, we'll give you $20 million, or whatever, we'd be like, that's nice and all, but you don't get to touch the screenplay. And Andrew's still the director and <laughs> right. we control everything we want to control. So you're well, it's one of those things where this could blow up. We don't have a cap on the funding. This could end up huge if somebody wanted to give us a huge amount of money to make it big, but he's in control of the screenplay and Andrew's the director, period. Excellent. Well, I, uh, as you say, this community is big enough to, to fund projects like this that truly can make a difference. And as you say, I think the effectiveness is in this is that essentially the audience, well, most of the audience will be going in as Mr. Jones in that mindset. At any rate, if you want to get, make people your slaves, you have to force them to be your slaves. And they look like this and they sound like this and they act like this. But then they start to realize, oh, wait, that's not how this really works. It's really this. Mr. Smith is really the control. Oh, I get it. So I think that, as you say, it's so effective. I'm very excited to see this. As you say, this is the perfect piece to dramatize because it certainly fits perfectly into that dramatic framework. I, I can see I can see it playing out in my head already. So I'm excited to see this come to fruition. What can the Corporate Report audience do to help you guys bring this to the, the silver screen? Well, we, we have our Indiegogo campaign now. Um, it has, uh, it's a flexible campaign. We have five days left in the uh, initial 30 days, but it keeps going after that. Yeah. And it, it's no not gap. like Kickstarter where if you don't get the goal, it all disappears. Like we get what they're giving and we will make this thing happen with what we already have. We will make it happen. Yep. The more we get, the better it'll look. <laughs> but at this point we're, we're both, uh, Andrew and, and, and us are both committed to we're going to make this happen one way or another. Um, so there's, you know, donating the campaign. There's also ways to donate by like Bitcoin and PayPal if you don't want to go through Indiegogo yes. for any reason. Um, and I'll, you know, I can give you that info. Um, and then there's just spreading it around. Like there's, like, I remember when the number of other voluntarists I knew was zero. <laughs> So now I know tens of thousands. And if each one chips at a few bucks, we can make literally a blockbuster movie that yeah. looks and sounds completely professional. And just because I'm not the director, I'm not the photographer. I don't I don't know that stuff. I'm I write the screenplay. I am doing the, the musical score because um, I actually know that stuff, which most people probably don't know about me because I don't do that in public. Um but in between, people who actually know what they're doing is gonna are gonna make a movie out of it. Um, so donating to to the campaign, but also just spread it around. If you know, if you don't have money to spare, or you want to donate one whole dollar, and then tell other people about it, that is the main challenge right now. Because you know, as you know, the way YouTube, you know, either all the way shuts people down or just suppresses it, and, and Facebook with their algorithms. You know, I have 25,000 people who follow me on Facebook and like this many of them see every post I get. Like, 
hmm, that's not at all suspicious. Like, Thanks, Facebook. They clicked on a button that said they wanted to hear what I have to say, and then almost none of them do. <laughs> so just just spreading the word is is a massive help, um, even if you can give little or nothing yourself, because and there are enough people that it's, you know, $125,000 to me is a massive amount of money. For a movie, it's kind of nothing, but we can do it professionally, and and of the people I know, that would be such a tiny fraction if people bother to do it, if people bother to make it happen. And for all the things that people like, we're going to chip in for this campaign, run for office that we lost. Whoops. Like, you know, <laughs> millions of dollars thrown into the, the, the circus, hoping to achieve freedom by doing that. And it was just like, well, how about if you take like literally 1% of what you were going to give to some political campaign and do it something that actually spreads the message in a non-corrupted, non-mangled, clear, professional way instead of, we have a slightly nicer slave master we'd like to run for uh, office. And uh, to the Corbett audience who loves Larkin and promotes his work, I have to say this too. We get asked this a lot, so I want to clear this up. A lot of people say, uh, what's going on with the mirror and is it still going on? The biggest thing about the mirror is... It's a project that normally you would have a team of dozens of people trying to do because it's so massive. He's got to control a lot of it himself. Number two, it has no monetary return on investment. He's going to give it away to the world for free and completely open, which means it's been the trickiest thing to actually get funding for consistently. For every person that asks, one out of a thousand actually help fund it. So the Jones Plantation, if you want to support something that spreads the message and funds Larkin's other incredibly valuable work, you would actually fund the mirror because when the Jones Plantation gets funded, he's hands off after the screenplay. And besides the score on the screenplay, he can be working on the mirror with the funding from the Jones Plantation and have time to put into that and be able to boost that and get that, you know, jump started and sped up and worked on faster and faster and finish faster. So this is just one more way that this ties into other stuff we're doing. It can fund our future music projects we want to do that nobody knows exist yet. And then, um, you know, putting out that, that mirror project that's so important. So this is, yeah, cause it could, it could so easily pay for the mirror. Cause you know, they say, Oh, that movie didn't do so well. It only made $10 million. It's like, wow, does that count? It's not doing great. Well. Like, yeah, like if we made if we made that much, we'd be like, well, everything we ever wanted to do is now funded. So mirror it, full time. Yeah. Yeah. He would be full time working on that. So you want to fund the mirror and fund something that's going to blow up the message and be this Trojan horse to the public consciousness. Just go after the Jones plantation. Help us get this, you know, badass. Uh, I will end with this obnoxious um, prediction. In a few years, I think there will be a huge number of people who point to the Jones Plantation movie as the thing that started them down the path, you know, down the rabbit hole to voluntarism. Because most of us have, oh, there was this little video or this book or this something. And I think this this is the perfect introduction for normal people. People have never thought about this yep. to just hurl them down the rabbit hole head first. And then, you know, once somebody gets on that track and then they're learning stuff and they're going out of their way to find stuff, I think this is this will be one of the best kick in the pants down the rabbit hole that I can imagine for, you know, the 7 billion people out there who haven't thought about this stuff. Exactly. And and as you say, especially at this moment in American political history with the cultural and racial divisions, this goes right into the heart of that. And yeah, all sorts of interest will be generated from just the, the context of the story alone, let alone the story itself. So yes, this is the right film at the right time. I'm very excited to see this project happening. I hope the Corbett Report uh, audience is too. I will be throwing in the links to the Indiegogo, to the Bitcoin and uh, B uh, Bitcoin Cash links, the, the PayPal. So if people want to fund it, they can do that. Of course, also all of the information about the the, the documentary, the, the uh, interview you did with uh, the, the director and all of that stuff. I'll put it in the show notes so people can go and check into it. And of course, just check into your uh, work generally. And I understand you have... Uh, yeah, ways that people can fund you directly that they can get access to snippets of the script and things like that. Is that true? That's right. We have the rose channel.com now that has however many hundred of my old, you know, audio podcasts. And I did a small bit of the script that I leaked to YouTube and a couple bigger pieces that went just to subscribers of the, the rose channel. And so there's, you know, there's extra stuff there that, that isn't, for the public. We still do a ton of stuff for free and then there's a little extra stuff there. Um, and then there's also the Patreon account for the, for the mirror. So there's a number of different 
ways that, that people can help out. And, you know, I'm doing 50 projects at once all the time. But right now, my main focus is is this, because this is the part that I have to do, which is the screenplay. You can't very well make a movie before the screenplay exists. So step one is what I'm frantically working on there. And then I hand it off to people way more competent than me who can actually make it into a movie. I will say that uh, he normally the way movies work is you get the funding for the screenplay and somebody will throw like $30,000 or $50,000. Somebody go, okay, now go write the screenplay. He started writing it the minute Andrew brought up the idea and he's more than halfway done already. And I'm his wife. I get to be here every day while he's telling me about the script and it it's in the rough draft mode and it kicks butt already. And he sent it to Andrew, the director. And Andrew was like, dude, I have to say, I hate first drafts of scripts always. And I already like this. This is amazing. And this is draft one, like this rocks. So it's going to be one of those. There's no filler. There's no showiness in terms of the movie. It's going to be every scene, every uh, conversation, every line is substance and crafted and well done. And this director understands aesthetic too, and how to make something that's aesthetically unique and has its own uh, sort of atmosphere, sort of how, you know, that weirdo, a lot of us love Tarantino has his own weird vibe and his distinction about his movies. Um, you know, Andrew wants this to have a distinctive vibe. So it very quickly gets a, you know, a cult following in a way that wants to spread it around. So I'm really excited for that. People in my yeah. audience actually might recognize the director as uh, the person who interviewed me about anarchism at, at Anarchopoco. And I think was one of my better uh, uh, interviews about voluntarism. So I, I know this guy can draw things out of his subjects and hopefully uh, do that in an aesthetic context as well. Um, I think we're going to leave the conversation there. Uh, you've already stolen my final question about the mirror. So <laughs> good. You've answered that. <laughs> How did you know I was going to ask? <laughs> it's it's perpetually my last question. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm glad to hear that that's still happening. And it's it's just a question of funding. So as always, it's the, the, uh, the thing that makes the world go round. Um, at any rate, we have to find ways to fund the projects that we care about and support the things that we care about because they will make a difference. And as you say, everyone has that little video or that that book or that thing that, that got them started along this path. This could be that tool for millions of people in the future to say, that was the thing that started me. And you out there could have a part in making that happen for other people. So uh, anyway, check out the links and uh, support it if you like it. Um, Larkin and Amanda, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, thank you guys again for your time. Thank you.